All right. Thanks, Anjoy. Uh, thanks, everybody. This is a little strange, one way sort of thing. Um, let's see. Uh, so Sanjoy told me just to take a few minutes and talk a little bit about my path to, I guess, this office and to my career and things like that. Uh, so I guess a little bit about myself and how I ended up here. I am um, a marine scientist by training. So I went to college in Florida where I got a marine biology degree. And when I went into college, I thought I would be studying dolphins or coral reefs or something like that. That's kind of the reason I went to Florida. Uh, and this was in the mid-90s. And in 1996, a very important uh, paper in the field of astrobiology came out by David McKay and authors uh, in Science, saying there was evidence of life in the Martian meteorite ALH84001. And I remember watching President Clinton uh, stand in the, the front lawn of the White House and make an announcement about that finding and the implications it had for uh, life on our planet. And I remember being really blown away by that. You know, by that point in time, I had already kind of figured out that life in the oceans wasn't just about fish and dolphins, that there were lots of microscopic life forms that played a really important role in uh, geochemistry and things like that, climate. And then I remember when that paper coming, coming out thinking um, that by studying microbes here on Earth, we could potentially study some, understand things about life elsewhere. Um, so July 4th, 1997, I was sitting on the couch of my molecular biology professor. He was having a barbecue, and we all watched Sojourner land um, on the surface when Pathfinder delivered Sojourner to Mars. And it, it just really, it blew, it blew me away. It blew, I think, a lot of us away. And so by that time... In my college career, it had kind of already changed tracks from coral reefs to um, geomicrobiology. So I, I was working with a scientist um, who was really interested in micro-mineral interactions. And we traveled to um, the Bahamas a couple of times to uh, study stromatolites which many of you are probably familiar with. There's some beautiful living stromatolites in the Bahamas. Um, and I was looking at microbes that were participating carbon, um, calcium carbonate. And it sort of just kind of took off from there. And I figured out I still wanted to be a marine scientist, um, but that the real action was with microbes. And it was looking at this interaction between the earth system and microbes. And um, with this cool kind of sidebar that you, by understanding life on earth, you could understand life beyond earth. So when it came time to go to graduate school, um, I sort of looked around for a program that it would allow me to expand a little bit, and I met my match um, in John Barrows at the University of Washington, who was your last speaker, I believe. Um, so I remember sitting in John's office when I was interviewing for graduate school, and we had this very wide-ranging discussion about everything from molecular biology to the origin of life. And um, compared to the other programs I was looking at, which were all very excellent people, I liked how UW, UW had a really wide vision of what studying oceanography could do and how big you could kind of think beyond, beyond Earth. And so I went there. Um, I can't actually remember. I was trying to remember, but I don't remember. Um, I don't remember when the astrobiology program at UW started, but when I initially went there, I was not in the astrobiology program because I wasn't really sure what that meant. And I was a little bit worried about keeping up in my own program, let alone some requirements from another program. Um, but I very quickly realized that the people I liked hanging out with the most were actually in the astrobiology program and that the faculty didn't really know how to teach that group of students. Um, it was very challenging to kind of cross these disciplinary boundaries. And so the students just got together, the first generation of students got together, and we sort of taught the kind of intro level to astrobiology, and we taught it to one another. So we relied on our planetary scientists to teach that aspect, and we relied on uh, the oceanographers to teach that aspect. But then sometimes, like, I got stuck teaching something about the rise of oxygen on our planet, which is not something I knew anything about at the time. Um, so we started making each other more comfortable outside our uh, departments. And that was really fun. Um, I'm a little um, scattered. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right word. 
I get a little bit bored thinking about just one thing. And what I loved about that program is it really let me uh, think big beyond uh, this tiny thing I was working on in the lab at, time, at the time. So I work on mainly deep sea hydrothermal vents, and I'm really interested in microbes that live within the crust that makes up the surface of our oceans. So microbes that are living in fluids that circulate through the rocks of our planet surface, the subsea floor biosphere. Um, and that was a very, very young topic when I started graduate school. There was maybe one or two papers using, using that word. Um, and so I spent six, six-ish years uh, in Seattle. I went to sea a lot. I became a very good oceanographer, very good microbial oceanographer. Um, and when the time came to leave uh, UW, I um, thought I needed to become maybe a better microbiologist, a better molecular biologist. And so I wrote a NASA postdoc fellowship proposal. At the time, it was through the NRC um, to come here, actually, to the MBL, which was one of the NAI nodes at the time, um, to learn sort of genomics and what genomics could do to inform us about life on our planet. I'd been doing some very, um, a lot of that work already at UW, but at a very low throughput scale, I would say. So I came here uh, and kind of caught the new wave of next generation sequencing, which is a DNA sequencing approach that now has been around for um, 11 years, but 10 years. When I came here, it was just starting, and I kind of got on that um, bandwagon and had samples in hand and ideas in hand for how to apply those methods. Um, and have since stayed pretty involved in NASA astrobiology. This is actually the first year in almost 10 years that I haven't had funding from NASA. Um, I transitioned from my postdoc to a faculty position here, um, and I then got a NASA ASTEP grant, which is a NASA astrobiology science technology exploration proposal with a number of colleagues here and JPL and Hui. Um, with that funding, we discovered the world's deepest hydrothermal system in the Mid-Cayman Rise. Um, and I tried to become part of the NAI through forming a new team here in Woods Hole. This last round, we were not successful. Um, but I'm still uh, peripherally involved through the University of Southern California's team. Um, so I'm a quote-unquote member of their team. Um, so I do a lot of basic oceanography and exploration, and whenever the opportunity arises, or I think my research kind of um, fits the bill for a NASA call, I try to squeeze myself into it whenever possible. Um, I also help direct a large NSF center called the uh, CW, Center for Dark Energy Biosphere Investigations, um, which is totally focused on life beneath the seafloor, and I think the links to astrobiology again there are very clear. Um, so I don't know what else I can say. I've kind of had a boring trajectory in that it's been very stepwise, but I've been at the same place for um, for 10 years now, which I think is shocking. Uh, before then, the longest I'd ever been in one place was in graduate school. So uh, it's nice to have put some roots down, and I'm still here. So um, is that good enough, Sanjoy? I'm happy to take any questions. I don't know what else I could talk about. <laughs> Has astrobiology made you a better microbial ecologist? That's a good question. Um, I think what's, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really know if, if it's made me a better microbial ecologist. It's definitely made me a better scientist. Um, because certainly being able to scale up is um, important, I think, in all of science. I think sometimes we get stuck in these little corners of our lab with this one tiny little problem or one little gene or something like that. And what I love about going to astrobiology conferences or just talking to people who think about these things is the really big scale um, that they think about. And so that's definitely made me a, a better scientist. It's also made me able to sit and listen and actually learn something from a lot of different talks and disciplines that I might not have been able to before. Um, so I can go to the planetary science uh, sessions at AGU or the soil ecology session or things like that. Um, so it's definitely made me a better scientist um, and made me think about my research in a bigger scale than, than I might otherwise. Um, it can also be really frustrating, though, which I'm sure most of you online can appreciate, which is that, you know, 
A perfect example is the number of table of contents you get in your inbox, right? And if you're into astrobiology, into all of these different disciplines, there's so many journals and so many things to keep up with. Um, I sometimes envy my colleagues from the NIH who are in this one very specific field of cell biology. And, you know, everything they publish in is in cell, science, nature, PNAS. And those are the only journals they read. Um, and, you know, it's also a little bit challenging, sort of the interdisciplinary nature of, of astrobiology. But it also just makes it more fun. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, you have dove and elven to the surface. So, so the seafloor, right. So yeah, so have you, Sanjoy, and uh, Rika, I see you're online. Um, yes, it's uh, pretty amazing diving in elven. Um, I've only dove a handful of times. Most of my work is with remotely operated vehicles, and that's kind of the nature of what I do on the seafloor, which is better served by being able to be there longer, which to me is one of the biggest limitations of Elvin. Um, so, you know, you get up, you have breakfast, you get in the sub, uh, you, it's usually relatively warm at the surface of the ocean, and then you, um, you know, make your way down into the dark, and it's very quiet, which isn't something I really appreciated, because when you're on a ship in the middle of the ocean, it's very loud. The ship is incredibly loud. The engines, the fans, the air conditioning, whatever. Um, the metal, the banging. But when you're in Elvin and you're descending, they turn off most of the power to save batteries, and you just sink. They have the sub weighted, so you sink to the bottom, um, and they turn off all the lights. And it's very quiet, and it's dark, and then things just start lighting up around you. And it, it's probably it's it's you know it's one of the most humbling experiences I've ever had. Um, you realize you are a very 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 small part of a very big planet, most of which is covered in water. Um, so it's truly, truly remarkable. Um, I had been going to sea for 10 years by the time I finally uh, dove in Alvin, and my first dive was at a volcano I had visited eight or 10 times with an ROV. And uh, I was really happy that I hadn't had a skewed view of it and that I understood it. Um, and it was great to be right up close and personal. Um, and so it was pretty, pretty amazing. Alvin was just re like overhauled the last couple of years. I haven't dove in new Alvin yet. Um, but I hope to. Um, so Graham asked, what would you say are the biggest questions right now for our understanding of deep sea hydrothermal systems? Um, so as a microbiologist, one of my biggest questions is how they're all connected, if they are at all. Um, you can kind of think of theories of island biogeography. You know, Galapagos finches are a really good example of that, Darwin's finches. Um, where each island, um, they were all maybe originally seeded the same, and then things evolved and adapted differently in different places. And it's been really hard to put together that big picture view of what's going on with microbes at vents. Uh, the animal community has been more successful with that because animals are a lot easier to study. You just pick them up off the seafloor and you can sequence a gene and say, okay, this worm has this gene and I can assign it to this genotype and things like that. With microbes, it's been a lot more difficult, but as sequencing technology has um, developed, we are now pretty, almost in a position where we can do some of these global biogeographic surveys and think about um, how life gets around, basically, how life gets around, how it adapts, whether or not it does adapt, or whether it's just random mutation. Um, I'm also really interested in this um, the connection between what's happening beneath the seafloor and the rest of the ocean in terms of export and import of both organisms and energy. So you can think about, you know, everyone thinks about the deep ocean as a sink for carbon in particular, but there's a lot of new production going on, all mediated by these microbes, and what is the impact of that back into the ocean. Um, and from a very, you know, sort of NASA-esque point of view, I'm just interested in basic exploration. Um, it's really exciting to make a map, dive down in a submarine or take an ROV somewhere and see what's there. What does it look like? You know, um, how are the animals there different from others? Are they new? Are they new to science? Um, how are the microbes there extracting energy? Uh, things like that. And I'd say about half the work in my lab um, 
is exploration based. You know, that funding is harder and harder to come by with. Um, but uh, it's been, I've seen some amazing things, you know, the first person to lay my eyes on particular things, and that's been truly, truly amazing. Um, so Jacob asked, as an oceanographer and astrobiologist, do you ever encounter conspiracy theory types who are convinced that intelligent life exists in the depths of the oceans? <laughs> do you have any strategies to responding to such ideas? Well, I, I, I hope none of you are those types. Um, I've, um, I've had a couple of strange phone calls, I guess. Um, the most recent was someone who just cold called me uh, from Indiana saying they had found a Martian meteorite on the side of the road and there was evidence of fungi in it and um, that he really wanted to collaborate with me on it and that, you know, this was a really, really big deal for astrobiology. Um, and I had no idea what to do. I was actively Googling him as he spoke to me. Um, and what I actually did is I passed him on to a colleague who works in microbes on ice um, because I wasn't sure how to handle it, but I knew I couldn't help him. Um, but I haven't really encountered people who think there's ET life, and you know, alien type of life deep in the oceans. And um, as much as I appreciate James Cameron and what he's done for generating excitement about um, the deep ocean, I'm also a little bitter about the impression that by studying life in the bottom of our ocean, it's going to help us, ex you know, find aliens on Europa's ocean or something. Um, I'm a firm believer in microbial life being uh, what we're going to find out there. <laughs> um, okay. So Nicholas asks, can you speak more about your experience with next-gen sequencing? Are you actively sequenced microbes in your lab? What technology are you using? Um, so when I came to the MBL in 2004, Four, we were still doing regular Sanger sequencing, but in 2005, uh, the 454 platform was announced, and we were one of the first labs to buy one of these machines. So we started with 454, and now we've pretty much switched over to Illumina technology. We have a HiSeq and a MySeq um, in the lab. And um, we use those for all sorts of things. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things we do with it. So we're sequencing um, mixed microbial communities from vents using PCR approaches, so just going after targeted genes like the 16S ribosomal RNA gene or functional genes. We're also doing very broad metagenomic surveys, so sequencing all the genes in the pool. Um, and we're also doing metatranscriptomics, so where we extract RNA instead of DNA. Um, and uh, trying to look at who the active players in the ecosystem are. We've also been doing a lot of manipulative experiments, which is kind of new to my lab, um, where we're collecting samples and trying to push the community in one direction to simplify the problem. Um, the problem being that in many of these environments, there's actually quite a bit of diversity, and that makes reconstructing genomes um, very difficult. And so... Um, one example is where I'm really interested in this idea of new production from the seafloor, and so we're, you know, adding isotopes for bicarbonate and other things and looking at which microbes are taking up that label and what genes they're expressing when they're uh, doing that, metab that uh, carbon fixation. So that is, uh, those are just a couple of examples. And then we also use it, you know, if we're growing interesting microbes in the lab and we want to know who they are, we usually just sequence their genome. It's cheap enough now that... Um, you can do that. And, you know, recently we published a paper where we had six strains of the lab, in the lab. They all, at the 16S level, were pretty much identical. And when we sequenced their ge genomes, we found these really interesting differences, um, basically that had to do with how phage um, was disintegrating parts of their genome or delivering new genes into the genome. Um, and that was pretty cool to see. And then to have the organism in the lab so we can mess with it. Um, we found some new functions in these microbes that no one knew they had before. And it looks like they acquired that function via a lateral gene transfer event from a terrestrial neighbor. Um, and thinking about that scale, you know, thinking about, you know, these microbes at the bottom of the ocean. These were from an erupting volcano in the Western Pacific who were carrying genes related to, you know, gram-positive thermophiles from Yellowstone. Um, and now they can do nitrogen fixation, which they weren't able to do before. Um, it's pretty, pretty amazing. So it's a really powerful approach, um, but I have 
a lot of things growing in the lab also. Um, and because it's really nice to be able to ground truth, or sometimes you can just get sick of looking at, you know, tubes that don't look like they have anything in them and getting some cells under the microscope and counting and growing something in the lab. Um, so Kamesh asks, what are the big questions in metagenomics that you are addressing? Is there anything that would be, surprise you with respect to origin of cellularity, such as identifying immediate, intermediate branches of life between archaea and bacteria? So I think I just talked a little bit about what we're doing at the metagenomics. Um, is there anything that would surprise me? You know, I haven't been looking at our data with my astrobiology hat on. I'll be, I'll be honest. I've been looking at it with my um, oceanographer, my, my microbial ecologist hat on. Um, and, but I think we're now getting to the point where we have enough command of the data. So the problem... For, for me has always been the diversity problem, but then also kind of getting past the, the basic ecology questions, getting good assemblies, really getting into the bioinformatics um, and, and pinpointing those, those more particular questions. And I think we're very close to doing that. Um, and one thing we're really interested in right now are, for example, um, viruses. And I, I mentioned, you know, these new functions that we're seeing in organisms that are clearly phage mediated um, but also looking at the free living viral pool and seeing what they could be bringing into the game. I just saw a paper in Nature Communications about archaea viruses and methane seeps or something like that. So I think there's a lot of potential discovery in that direction, and, and particularly um, in, the, in the archaea. We are also doing some single cell genomic work. Um, uh, we've just assembled those, which was a huge problem in and of itself. Um, and Rika, who's online here is coming to my lab in a couple weeks and she'll be spending the next year hopefully helping us unravel some of that data. Um, so no, James Cameron's Abyss wasn't based on a true story. <laughs> um, Jacob asks, speaking of Europa, what do you see as a realistic future timeline for exploring this icy moon? In other words, how soon and how many missions could we learn if Europa's oceans are inhabited? That's a really good question. I've been really dismayed at the pace um, of that timeline because I've been talking to people about that, you know, since 1999 or whatever, when we first realized that Europa had an icy shell and that it had this tidal, tidal heating. Um, I recently had an interesting um, experience where I was asked to join a group um, called LIFE, um, I can't remember what the LIFE stands for, but they're really interested in capturing a plume sample from Enceladus um, and bringing it back. And it was so bogged down in the mechanics of planetary protection and other issues that it was really, uh, it was, it was kind of disenchanting, to be honest. Um, and I, I don't ever see how something with sample return could ever fly, literally fly. Um, it would just, I don't think it would ever make it through um, from what I've seen. But I think for robotic missions, there's huge, huge, huge potential. And I've also been dismayed at this, um, well, at the funding situation, but at kind of this fight about um, manned missions versus robotic explorations versus these sort of things. You know, we need to get a robot on one of these icy moons. And to me, that should be the top priority. Um, and I don't spend enough time lobbying Congress as I probably should, but... Um, so I don't know. I don't know the timeline. My, my recent experience has been fairly depressing. Um, but hopefully with these, you know, the new papers coming out, there seems to be a big paper every year that people get really excited about. Um, and I know Congress did earmark some money in the NASA budget for Europa. So I will just keep my fingers crossed and, and, and hope we can get there. So building on Jacob's question, where in the solar system do I think is the best place that life may exist? I would definitely say in a place with an ocean, <laughs> which probably isn't surprising given I'm an oceanographer. Um, I'm, I've, I've always been fascinated with this idea of, of life beneath the European ocean. Um, and I've, I've learned quite a bit about Enceladus and Titan in the last year, a couple of years. And I still have a little bit of trouble understanding um, the type of life we would find there. But that's just because I'm not perhaps creative enough to think about the weird life. I can think of more normal life, actually, Earth-like life. 
on a place like Europa, um, which would make it easier to detect. Um, I also don't think we're done with Mars. I mean, I think, you know, the evidence that there was an ocean and that there was liquid water running on the surface and, you know, you could imagine mounting a drilling campaign to, to, um, to Mars and learning an awful lot just by looking uh, beneath the surface at Mars. We're not going to find life on the surface of Mars, but we, we could maybe find life beneath the surface. All right, Kamesh is asking, can whole genomes of different species be constructed from environmental samples uniquely in individual with metagenomics? Because it's always like millions of different things in the sample, right? Uh, it's not like millions. It sort of depends on the samples. But yes, you can reconstruct genomes. And one of the big challenges right now is getting down to the strain level of um, genomic reconstruction. And that has been more successful because we can now sequence much more deeply than we used to be able to. Um, some of the best examples of people doing this successfully are in very um, not complex environments like acid mine drains or places with really high pH. Uh, the human gut is another good example where there's really only about 100 to 1,000 dominant microbes. Um, and there's a nice catalog of culture genome, cultured organisms with genomes. So that helps with mapping and things like that. Um, in some of these more complex environments, though, we've also been able to start those reconstructions. Um, and when you can really get everything together, you can start to ask those types of speciation questions that I'm really interested in. Um, how things are adapting or evolving or not, or just mutating randomly um, or interacting uh, with that reconstruction. So I would say the bioinformatics it has gotten there probably just in the last year or two. Um, and the software is better. We still have this big kind of upfront problem, which no one really likes to talk about, um, which is still just being able to assemble it all, stick it all back together. Um, you know, we have we have a four terabyte RAM uh, drive, and and even then we're we're struggling, um, just because these are really short reads. There's a lot of diversity, um, but some of the new technologies like Pack Bio Sequence or long read sequencing are helping close some of those gaps too. Um, okay, Sanjoy is asking, can you tell us a bit more about C. Debbie and how it relates to astrobiology? Uh, sure, I can. So uh, C. Debbie is a NSF-sponsored science and technology center. These are large um, interdisciplinary centers that are five-year programs, um, and they're rooted in a theme. And so our theme is um, life beneath the seafloor and the sediments and rocks that makes up the surface of the planet. Um, there are STCs on evolution. There's um, STCs on earthquakes, big data, all sorts of things. Um, so we're really, the first phase of CW, which we're just coming to an end on, was really involved with um, the Integrated Ocean Drilling Program, which is now called the Ocean Discovery Program. I don't know what it's called. Anyway. We drilled a lot of holes in the seafloor. We collected a lot of sediments and rocks. We instrumented the seafloor, and we're learning a lot of really basic things about life beneath the seafloor. Um, so how does that relate to astrobiology? Well, in a huge way, I was just talking about, you know, imagine what we could discover if we had the opportunity to drill hundreds of meters into Mars, for example. Um, so in some of the places that we've drilled and collected um, samples, we see... Um, microbes that are barely detectable, barely countable, for example. Um, a paper just came out in Nature Geosciences um, from Steve DeHunt's group um, showing that in the South Pacific gyre, where there's very little organic carbon input, there are still microbes, just a few, um, that are making a living still by eating organic carbon, um, but still making their way uh, at this very, very, very low energy environment. Um, and we've been thinking a lot about life at this extreme low energy thought um, end of the spectrum. So, you know, hydrothermal vents are super rich in life, for example, um, in energy and life. And there's tons of electron sectors and donors. But in some of these really slow places, there's very little. And we are often having this debate in our community about with such a low energy threshold, do we even think organisms can evolve or are they just stuck? Um, 
And so that's a big theme in CW, especially moving forward. We're going to try to artificially evolve some of these organisms and see how they do. Um, and so those are just some of the connections. Um, and of course, we develop a lot of cool technology in CW, and they're the types of things I always tell JPL scientists, you know, if you can't do that on the bottom of the ocean, you probably aren't going to be able to do it in space because the ocean is a brutal, brutal place to test a piece of instrumentation. It's hard to communicate in the ocean. You can't use radio. Um, I was at JPL a few years ago and went to their uh, the Mars rock field, basically, where they this big field that looks like Mars where they, you know, any before they send a command up to Mars to do something, they test it there. And I remember thinking, well, how nice that they can use radio to do that because we can't do that in the ocean. It works really poorly. Um, and so the ocean is a great place to test a lot of that instrumentation as well. All right, so I need to back up here. Nicholas asks, do you have an opinion on the supposed microbial-induced sedimentary structures that have been found on Mars? Do you think these were created by microbes? Answer, I have no idea. Um, sedimentary structures are not, uh, an opinion on that is not something I've, I've tried to get involved in. I recently saw a paper in PNAS that about how evidence for 2.8 billion old life that had not evolved and it was all based on physical structure. And um, I do a lot of looking at things under the microscope and then I sequence their genes and they look exactly the same under the microscope and their genes are very, very different. And so I think um, implying biology-based, you know, what these microbes could have done based on simple physical aspects is very, very challenging. Um, so Rika asks, uh, in microbiology, I think astrobiology is viewed skeptically because of the arsenic debacle a couple years ago. Have you encountered this? How have you dealt with it? And the following question was similar. Any thoughts on the arsenic life bacterium? Um, right, so, so that was unfortunate, <laughs> um, that was just, that was, that was just unfortunate, I guess, um, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary data, I think it was a good lesson for all of us, um, I think, you know, yeah, I probably shouldn't say much, because I still want to get funded by certain people who are involved in that work. <laughs> Um, but I do think it was an important lesson for all of us in if you think something's that big, you know, spend the extra six months making sure it really is that big. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been caught a little bit with that. I have published papers where there is data that is not entirely correct. Um, and that was mainly due to the resources we had at the time that everybody had. And I still find it fairly entertaining that some people come back to me and say, I want to reanalyze your data from 2006. And I say, well, you know, we already, <laughs> we already, uh, we reanalyze about a hundred times. We know we got it wrong. Um, and it's been kind of entertaining. I haven't actually encountered um, any difficulties in my own career because of what happened in this perception of astrobiology. Um, I have made sure that I have solid grounding in a home field, and for me, that's deep sea oceanography. Um, and I, you know, perhaps that's just a safety measure, but um, I think, you know, sort of to Sanjoy's question, what advice would you have for students interested in pursuing astrobiology as a career? I think it's, it's a good idea to have, um, you know, you got to be, for, to get a PhD, you're supposed to be the world's expert in something. Um, and make sure you're very, very good at that one thing and lead with that, um, I guess, would be my, would be my advice. Um, it's a little bit of a slippery slope. You know, I, when I had my NASA postdoc, back then there were three years of funding, and in the middle of my second year, uh, the President of the United States at the time cut the budget. Uh, now the astrobiology budget got cut by 30%, and so I lost my third year, kind of got, just got pulled out from under me. Um, and so I do think there are sometimes dangers being in these, um, these interdisciplinary fields that, let's be honest, they do kind of come and go sometimes. Um, and so having a solid grounding in ocean sciences and uh, microbial sciences has, has, you know, saved me when I needed saving. Um, hold on. 
else does it look in? Your favorite, most favorite adventurous ocean field trip. Wow. Um, let's see. Well, favorite and adventurous don't always go together. Um, my favorite expedition was um, in 2000, uh, I guess it was 2009, and it was to an underwater volcano uh, near Samoa. And a couple months earlier, a number of my colleagues from NOAA had been doing a water column survey and mapping cruise and had detected what they thought was some really high volcanic activity beneath the sea, ben, um, at the seafloor. And we were able to rally funding from NSF and NOAA pretty rapidly to rapidly, right, six months, um, to get out there for a very short, for an eight-day cruise to see if we could catch um, a volcano live um, erupting in action. And um, within six hours of leaving port, we had an ROV in the water. We were down about 1,500 meters, and we saw, um, you know, the most spectacular thing I've ever seen, which is this. Uh, volcano erupting. The name of the volcano is West Mata, M-A-T-A. You can Google it. And we caught the first ever images of a deep sea eruption. Um, and it looked just like lava bombs going off. It was absolutely amazing. And, you know, I was out there with geophysicists who had been working in the field for 30 plus years. They were running to the side of the ship to see if you could see anything at the surface. I mean, that's how impressive it looked beneath the surface. Of course, you couldn't. It was 1,500 meters beneath the surface, and the ocean has an amazing dampening effect. Um, and when we were looking at it, you know, we turned our vehicle 10 meters to the left, and there were these shrimp feeding on microbial mats. And it was really amazing to see this really fundamental earth process, this particular type of eruption we now know is called a bonanite eruption, and it has to do with being in a subduction zone and blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's, that's the type of volcanism has probably been going on for 4 billion years, and we are the first people to see it. And, you know, it's truly remarkable. And, you know, the chief scientist came up to me and he said, it's a really good thing you're a microbiologist because this is the holy grail of volcanologists, and we're done. Um, he's like, I'm going to retire now. We're done. Um, and it was, it was really, really amazing. Um, the most adventurous... Uh, I'd have to think about that. Hold on, let me let me type in the name of the volcano because some, someone asked. So yeah, if you Google West Mata eruption, you should be able to find some some videos. Um, I was a lot more adventurous when I was young and didn't have kids. Um, <laughs> my most recent adventure was also my first as a chief scientist on on a cruise, and I was off the coast of Oregon. Uh, at my favorite underwater volcano there, about 300 miles offshore. And I was, we were right on the tail end of the good season in the North Pacific. And we got killed by a storm. We got hit by 60-plus um, knot winds for four or five days. And we had no choice but just to, to outrun the storm. Um, and it was one of those moments where it was adventurous. Um, I wasn't super happy about it. But, you know, within the 24 hours, we had to make a decision, do we go into port or do we ride it out and see if we can get more dives in? And the captain allowed us to stay out there, which was the decision of the science party. Um, ultimately, the captain could have said, no, you're crazy, we have to go in. Um, the storm turned out to be a lot worse than the forecast. Um, but we did get one more dive in the end. Um, but it was pretty amazing. Uh, we were on the seafloor doing our science and we watched the wind turn 180 degrees and drop to zero. So all of a sudden, it had been blowing 20 knots. It just dropped to zero. And then it switched directions and just started ticking up. So we very quickly took the vehicle out of the water, which takes about an hour, an hour and a half. By the time we got the vehicle on deck, it was 30 knots. Within two hours, we saw gusts over 80 knots. And so uh, it, was, uh, it was quite an adventure. I should also mention that I get seasick. And so it was... Um, especially adventurous like that. Um, and so I, uh, we rode it out for five or six days, and then we were able to get back in the water. But I've never been so happy to come back to land as I was after that expedition. Um, okay, did you, have, did you get a scientific diving license for your career? Um, I did not. When I was an undergraduate, I did take 
a scientific diving course. I was already certified um, through NAWI, um, and I got one thinking I might go on this coral reef track, um, but I it, it figured out pretty quickly it wasn't going to be necessary for, for graduate school, and so I only use scuba diving if it's below 60 feet and there's a lot of bright sunlight and, and warm water. <laughs> All right, are there any other questions or, oh, no, yes, no. Oh, ah, Sanjoy, have you faced challenges of women in science and how have you addressed them? It's a good question. Um, I don't know if you can see it. I have my, my women in science Lego set behind me. That's what this one is. There's a chemist and a paleontologist and an astronomer. My son is not allowed to play with those. Um, Uh, yeah, so in the my, in my field, you know, I wear these two different hats, right? So in ocean sciences, um, I remain a minority. Um, in, in biological sciences, there are quite a few women up the ladder. But as I've gone up the ladder, right, from graduate school to postdoc to faculty to um, associate, whatever, um, you know, I've lost a lot of my female colleagues, and that has been difficult to see, and um, it's a really complicated problem, um, and I, I don't have any answers except for how I've addressed them, which is by surrounding me with strong uh, personal mentors and professional mentors. Um, I ask for advice all the time. I've never been shy about asking for help or asking questions, and that, you know, I ask uh, not only women, but also, you know, two of my best mentors are men, um, and they've helped me make the right, you know, the, when I've been faced with some difficult decisions, they've helped me make those decisions. Um, I also have a very strong partner who is supportive in my personal life and is, you know, um, if anyone's ever watched, Sheryl Sandberg gives this amazing talk, on a TEDx talk, TED talk, I guess. This was kind of before Lean In became a thing about three of the most important things women can do. Um, and this kind of applies to any situation, not that it's just the sciences, but one is to get a seat at the table. And I always tell that to my students and postdocs. You know, if you're having lunch with a speaker, don't sit in the back of the room, sit right next to them. If it's a meeting, you know, don't sit in the back row, sit in the first row. Um, because people need to even know you want a seat at the table. Um, the second one was to don't count yourself out before you're even given the chance. And so, you know, kind of the classic example is someone quitting their job because they think they want to have a baby. Um, so even before they're pregnant and seeing when that likes opting out. Um, and the third is to, again, you know, uh, have a real partner who is invested in your career as well as you personally. And so I tried to follow that and also surround myself with good mentors. And um, But I've also been faced with just some really awkward situations with until you actually do them, <laughs> until you're actually a woman who is still nursing a child and has to go to sea for two weeks, you won't get it. Um, none of my mentors got that, right? I didn't know who to ask about that. I just did it. I had the awkward conversation with the male chief scientist, and we moved on. Um, so a lot of it is just also making sure you know what's important to you and, and doing it. Um, so I do view mentorship as key to successful scientific careers for both men and women. Um, and I've been very, very lucky in that, in that regard. And I've had a few people who I would have loved to have been my mentor. Um, and then I figured out that they weren't going to work out for various reasons and uh, stepped away from that. What do I do for fun? Well, I have two kids. I don't know if you call that fun, um, but that takes up a lot of my time. I play a lot of Legos, as you can see. I have a whole nother set back there too, like the Ninjago set. Um, what do I do for fun? I like to run. I um, have a sailboat here in Woods Hole, so even though the pond is still frozen, um, when it's done freezing, we do a lot of sailing locally with our family. Um, I really like watching TV, so I like... <laughs> Well, that sounds lame. I think in another life, if this hadn't worked out, I would love to be a TV critic. Um, and I travel a lot. You know, I 
was just laying out my travel schedule for the next six months, and I get to go to Europe, and I get to go all over the states, and so I love going to new places and trying new food and um, doing those sort of things. Uh, my current favorite show right now was well, I'm behind. I'm watching The Good Wife. I'm on season four, so um, it's been so cold here. I haven't been able to run outside, so I've been stuck to my treadmill. And thank God for for Netflix, basically. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of what I do. I don't know. It's a pretty simple little life. <laughs> All right. Are there any more questions? Um, okay. Well, thanks, everyone, for signing on. Uh, I know I'm not quite as entertaining as John Barrows, but there can be... Oh, someone does have one. Go for it. What did I think of the movie Europa Report? I did not see it. <laughs> um... I'm waiting. Is it on Netflix? I'll watch it if it's on Netflix, but I wasn't even sure how I could watch it. Oh, good. Okay. I will see it. Okay. Well, now I'm obliged to see it. All right. Thanks, everyone.